Hello, I'm so delighted, Amber, that you take the time to talk to me when there's so much going on in the world. Uh, so we talked at the launch and now we have images. And I, I mean, I didn't realize how hard it was going to hit me. So my first question for you is which image do you think hit you the hardest? I'm going to make you pick a baby. I know, I know. You're going to make me pick, pick a child. Um, <laughs> So, and it's also a little tricky because, you know, unlike the rest of the world that got them sort of all at once, right. I'm one of the internal NASA reviewers for all mm -hmm. this stuff. So I started seeing them trickle in, you know, about a week and a half or so before the public saw them. But right. all of that said, I think, and I studied Galaxy, so I was expecting to be blown away by the deep field image, which I mm -hmm. was. But the Carina Nebula, I, I mean. think, you know, that's the one that like, made me cry you know <laughs> yeah it is definitely the most beautiful one i for whatever reason like the deep field i was like yes this is a much better deep field image than we've ever had i can tell instantaneously but it is just a bunch of galaxies uh not in a super structured way and it, it's sort of like it requires a lot of knowledge of where we're at to appreciate i, I think deeply whereas the other yeah. images all of them are just like oh like exactly. hubble took some amazing pictures but n now they look blurry <laughs> yeah isn't that <laughs> just, that's incredible yeah, yeah. so i have a, right. a question from my son who's five um and he just this weekend asked me why things exist and i figured i'd i'd shoot my shot and if i was going to talk to an astrophysicist it's probably the best opportunity i get to find out maybe why things exist I mean, that's sort of one of these age old philosophical questions. Why is there something rather than nothing? Right? Yeah. Yeah. I feel like philosophers and astronomers have been asking this question forever. And I don't, I don't know. I don't think. We yeah. Can that's know. what I, that's what you I know? had to say. You don't think we can know? You don't like, this is the thing. There's always been big mysteries. Like where did people come from was a pretty big one for, for most of the time. Sure. Uh, and we we did figure that out, uh, you know. Well, there's there's lots of details uh, and cracks to fill in, but uh, do you not think it's possible to know why there is something rather than nothing? I don't know. I really don't, yeah. um, because it seems like it does seem like we're edging from science more like into philosophy. I get and... well, but isn't that that's always what it feels like at the edge of yeah. science? That's true. No, that's absolutely true. I definitely don't know. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. And... That's what I told him. I was like, buddy, we don't we don't I don't know how that's going to make you feel, but we we don't know. Uh, another question I got a lot and have myself is how frequently. So like you saw pictures starting like a week before they got released. Um, but I, I like a lot of those pictures took a long time to take. Like they're a composition of hundreds of pictures that took a long time to prepare into yep. their final most beautiful forms. How often can we expect as lay people to get to get new stuff? Because of the fact that a lot of the data, the, the observations that are taken in the first year um, are actually public immediately, um, mm -hmm. that means we're going to get a lot of it kind of really fast. And we've already seen that, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, because last week, you know, we, re we released the, the first images on Tuesday. The following day, we released all of that, um, mm -hmm. that data to the public. Mm. Um, and then the next day, all of the data, everything that's been taken during the six months of commissioning was released. And out of that, we've already seen some little nuggets, right? We saw this yep. really cool image of Jupiter. We've seen uh, this incredible mid-infrared image of this galaxy from the FANGS project. I saw that and I was like, I, I like had to fact check it. I was yeah. like, is this actually... <laughs> a it looks like a portal, a portal yeah. to another dimension or something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So, so the, the short answer is um, astronomers are already getting data and they are jumping on it and they are putting it out there in the world, which is great. So the way NASA sort of, you know, officially releases these super, you know, beautifully processed uh, images, um, sort of, you know, now that we're in routine science operations, which still it's mm -hmm. like, it's, I can't believe we're here. It's awesome. Yeah. Um, but the way that happens is based on peer-reviewed publications. So every NASA science press release you see that comes out that's often accompanied by a beautiful image like this um, is based on a scientific result. So, um, so that process takes time, of course. There are already yep. papers that are being written based on some of this early data, but um, and it's hard to know how fast those will move through the, the publication process. Um, but I, I would say likely after 
you know, several weeks, month-ish, depending on that, we're going to start to get really regular cadence of scientific results right. uh, accompanied by beautiful images. But in the meantime, there are these little nuggets that are going to be constantly right. coming out. I feel like I should. we should just every month we should do a video that's like, here's, here's, wh yeah. here's what else is happening. Yeah. <laughs> uh, exactly. James Webb update. Uh, that, that's so cool. I, I don't know. It just seems so big and there's so much opportunity and and also so you said that the first uh, a, a lot of this data for the first year is going to be just immediately public yeah and so that was by design um yeah. because you know this is a brand new telescope astronomers really need to figure figure out how to use it you know it has these 17 different modes across the four instruments it's a complicated observatory uh, and a really intentional part of the first year was scheduling a lot of the first observations really in the first six months um, mm -hmm. to really test out these modes. And this was all done through a peer review process. You know, astronomers wrote, wrote proposals about their great ideas to how to sort of test out the observatory. Um, and those are being scheduled very early. So some of that data has already been taken. Um, and yeah, as soon as it's taken, it's basically released um, to the teams that proposed it, but also to the broader um, you know, astronomical community so that everyone can sort of start digging in and figuring right. out how to optimize it. Yeah. Right. And also if you get in that data, you could, you can crunch your own, you can create your own image from it um, exactly. if, you, yeah. if you want to. Um, mm -hmm. And the, a big question that I've seen a lot of people have, and I know this isn't like your area of expertise or anything, but is, so these are a, a lot of like the majority of the wavelengths that Webb is detecting are not ones that our eyes can detect. So people are like, if I was like there, would it look like this? Not to your eyes, uh, maybe to someone's eyes who can detect those uh, those wavelengths, but uh, li literally you couldn't see what uh, a lot of the wavelengths that Webb is detecting. So we have to figure out a way to make them visible. Right. And uh, the, the process, as I understand it, is you, you, you sort of assign wavelengths to colors. Yep. Um, because colors is what we have to work with. And so you sort of like break up the wavelengths, which is a br much broader spectrum of wavelengths than we can detect. And then you, uh, and then you sort of like let the image be the image based on what you assign. You don't get to just like pick whatever thing looks coolest. You do. There is like a a, a process for how you pick the wavelengths. Yeah, yeah. That's that's essentially exactly how it works. And and it's the same even like with Hubble images, right? Right. Um, because you know the and the question about like oh if I was there. <laughs> always is a little strange because what does there mean with the Carina Nebula? I mean, this thing is light years across, you know, <laughs> but I understand why people ask it. It's super weird because even on Earth, things look different depending on how you light them. So the process of selecting what to take pictures of, um, clearly we have a pretty good idea now of what's in the sky. <laughs> like we've we've uh, done a, like a, a, a bunch of work figuring out interesting places in the sky, and I'm sure we haven't found all of them. But, you know, in our galaxy, we found a lot of big nebulas, you know, hundreds of years ago. Outside of our galaxy, we've been doing a lot of work uh, with a lot of instruments for a long time. So we have ideas of the things that we want to look at. But actually, what to decide to... This, this, this is a single instrument that can do... I mean, it has multiple instruments, but it's a single uh, telescope that can do only so much. It only has 24 hours a day to do observations. How do you decide what to take pictures of? Um, and also to be the person sending in a proposal and being like. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's how that's how I feel every year when I submit proposals for yeah. <laughs> for Hubble and now JRC. But yeah, that's exactly how it works. So basically once a year, um, this is how it works for Hubble, how it works for JWST. Once a year, astronomers from around the world get together, usually in teams. Um, and write up their proposals. Like, this is my best idea for where to point mm -hmm. the telescope based on this awesome science I want to do. And then they yeah. submit those proposals. And over the course of a few months, another team of astronomers gets together and grades the proposals and ranks them. And the highest ranked ones get chosen. And this is all um, dual anonymous. So neither side sort of knows wow. what's going on. That's a fairly Good. recent development. That's yeah. um, the Hubble. That's great. The Hubble folks have only started that, um, I don't know, four or five, six years ago, I can't remember. Um, mm -hmm. But it's, it is, and it's great. It's, it's actually that process of making it dual anonymous has helped increase the number of women 
KPIs that get mm. selected, and also the number of young, like early career folks that sure. proposals get selected. Because you don't have that bias. Oh, yeah. You don't have like, you, you made like friends for the last 20 years of your career, yeah. and you're like, oh my God, I like this is, a, this is a really cool proposal, and it's Jeff. I love Jeff. Exactly. You know, you know obviously there's huge oversubscription. Uh, the Hubble, the Hubble oversubscription rate is usually about 10 to 1, so 10 times as wow. uh, as much time as requested. So we just need nine more Hubbles. Uh, right? Yeah, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and we expect it to be that, you know, um, you know, similar levels for JWST. But the thing is, one good thing working in our favor is um, JWST is actually quite a bit more efficient at, at observing yeah. than Hubble is. So we are actually yeah. pointing at things, actively taking data on the sky about 70% of the time. So it has about a 70% efficiency. Can it just move around faster? Not necessarily, but of course Hubble, since it orbits the Earth, it's only sort of available to look out half the time-ish. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so you've doubled the efficiency of the telescope in that way. But yep. also it's just more sensitive, so you can take images, pictures pictures faster. Exactly. And that's one yeah. of the, the key things about the deep field is that, yeah. you know, this is the deepest infrared image that we've ever taken. And this image was taken in to a total of 12 hours, so two hours per color. Um, and then there's gotcha. six different colors stacked on top of each other. So 12 hours compared mm. to two weeks of Hubble observations to get right. to a comparable depth. So are you going to do a, a two week exposure? Yeah, um, may, maybe not exactly two weeks, but there are deep, yeah. deep, deep fields coming. Um, yeah, where, where, because you got, you're gonna, you know, you've only had, I mean, how long has the the telescope been actually like taking useful data right now? At this point, it's been a few weeks. So we started. The, oh wow. Um, yeah, not very mm, long. I thought it, I thought longer than that. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we wanted to get those first images out to the public like as soon as conceivably possible. I don't know. It just seems like it would take longer than two weeks to get all those images together. I looked at the full image of the quintet mm -hmm. and it's just like, yeah, it's very it's a lot of pixels, It's tons and tons of images. <clears throat> so we started taking I, I want to say we started taking the first Eero data a few weeks before we released it. Um, okay. And then, of course, it was, you know, there was other stuff kind of interspersed in. Uh, during yeah. the commissioning with that. But yeah, I think it was a few weeks before we released it. Um, and then, okay. you know, it's like time awesome. to process so, them. And, and yeah. so, yeah. But but because you've only had a few weeks, uh, you know, when, when that, that first deep field image, you know, you wanted to have a deep field in there. It's great to have it be a, a lens, like a, like a cool lens. Um, but you can go deeper. Yes, easily, <laughs> easily. This was just a few hours. Um, and oh yeah, we do plan to yeah. take super, super deep uh, fields, which will be awesome. And I have no doubt. Yeah. I mean, we have demonstrated just with <clears> this <throat> sort of shallow, you know, <laughs> short time deep field <laughs> yeah. that it's not even going to take that much effort to break the, the distance record, you know, to find sure. the most distant yeah. galaxy. You all found an old galaxy in that deep field image and, and you put a little box around it. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's yeah. the dot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, in and, um, and looking for the first population of stars in the early universe is also a yes. big thing we want to do. Uh, but mm -hmm. it's going to be hard to do. And we think it's going to have to happen through some sort of similar, like tricks of physics, like gravitation, like the gravitational. You definitely need lensing. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. You need to point your telescope at a telescope yeah, to get that exactly. one to happen. <laughs> um, and, that, and that's like pre-galaxies is what you're looking at there. Yeah, yeah. Or, yeah. Well, it's sort of chicken and egg, right? Galaxies or stars. But yeah, these um, population <laughs> three stars, these exotic, enormous stars that burned out super, super fast, blew themselves to smithereens mm -hmm. and sort of started started that process of seeding the universe with, with heavier elements. Yeah. The, a thing that didn't hit me, and this is going to sound weird until these images, is that the universe is not very old. <laughs> Life has existed on our planet for about 27% of the lifetime of the universe. Yep. Um, there's 7 billion people on our, on our planet, which means every two years we collectively experience the lifetime of the universe. 
Like, the the potential lifetime of the universe is basically infinity, so 13.7 billion is a very small <laughs> fraction of infinity. Zero. Uh, if you're asking somebody who is does math. Uh, and, and then, like, when you're talking about, like, the, the last star formation, we're still, like, not, less than 1% of the way through. Yeah. This is a very weird thought to feel like 13.7 billion years is not a long time. But but that is, like, that's sort of the feeling that I'm getting, like, when we're able to see not just, like, the beginning of the universe, but also all of the rest of it. Yeah. Where it's like, we have an idea of what the universe was like every, you know, few hundred million years the whole time. And it's been changing. It's different now than it was then. And, uh, and like, there are ways in which our planet couldn't have existed, certainly not in the beginning of the universe when it was just hydrogen, uh, but also kind of couldn't have existed for, for quite a while. It took a lot of time of stellar formation and heavy element creation and lots of supernovas to get to where we are right now. There's a timeline, and it, and it has a history, and all of that history has added up in, to, to now, and we can imagine what it will look like in the future based on what we know. This is amazing. I'm, like, this is so much more stuff than we knew 50 years ago. Oh, yeah, that's for sure. Yeah, I've never thought about the age of the universe in terms of that, like, humans on Earth, the gener that's That's an interesting way to think about it. But, but yeah, when you think yeah. of how much we've learned in the last, yeah, in the last 50 years, it's just, you know... It's hard to it's hard to even imagine what we'll know fifty years from now. So I got some, a question on Twitter. Uh, can, uh, how uh, can we take a picture of like my house and and how how detailed would my house be? Um, so <laughs> shall let you answer. Yeah, we cannot take a picture of your house with this telescope um, because the telescope always has to point out um, because it's yeah. so so super sensitive. If we pointed the telescope back towards uh, the Earth, which would be back towards the sun we would burn out the detectors because the sun's an enormous, huge infrared source. So we can't, we yes. can't go outside and feel it. You will be an infrared telescope. <laughs> exactly. So we can't, we can't point the telescope back towards earth. Um, as far as like what details it would like, I mean, the question is like the resolution at that distance, what details would you be able to see on earth? And that's a good question that I haven't done the math for, but it's relatively mm -hmm. straightforward to, to be able to figure out the resolution, but I can't do it in my head. Yeah. <laughs> okay. How about this? Can the web look at uh, the Alpha Centauri system and what might we discover by doing that? Um, I believe so. Yes. Um, and I don't know why we wouldn't do that. And we know that it has yeah. planets, although... I'm not an exoplanet scientist, um, so I'm a bit out of my depth when talking mm. details, but I don't think the Alpha Centauri planets transit, right? They don't. So, yeah, they do not. So it wouldn't do a lot of good, actually, to look at them, um, because right. we do have some uh, cor uh, coronography capability on the telescope, where basically you can block out the light of the central star and sort of image mm -hmm. the planets around it. Which um, image is a is a strong word, right? They're just little teeny, dots, little yes. teeny pixels. Yeah. Um, uh -huh. So presumably we could do that. Mm. We might be doing that. I don't. I don't know. To be honest, the questions you could answer. I, it would be interesting to talk to an exoplanet scientist about the kinds of questions you could answer, but they don't seem to be big because the reason that Webb is super good at exoplanet research is to do with transits. Yes. yes. Transit spectroscopy. So tell me about that. Yeah, transit spectroscopy is definitely where it's at with this telescope. And of course, yeah. um, that is watching a, a planet, an exoplanet, as it transits in front of its star, and then looking at the starlight that's filtered through the planet's atmosphere. And, um, and of course, this was one of the five that we released last week, um, mm -hmm. the spectrum of this um, WASP-29b planet. And... Um, which is incredible. You know, the spectrum, not so pretty, doesn't get a lot of front page <laughs> newspaper. Uh, it is what it is, um, you know? Well, we, we, we want to be like, wow, that's very pretty. But it is, it's yeah. incredible. So it doesn't have the aesthetic, yeah. you know, draw that yes. the others, but mm -hmm. it's incredible. I mean, this is yeah. by far the most detailed spectrum we've ever gotten of an exoplanet same story in a fraction of the time that it's taken to get yep. you know anything even approaching as close yeah. um, well i was looking at at uh, data from hubble uh exoplanet transits and as you say it only gets it half the time so you're doing a lot of like overlapping and you have to like get it over and over again to get the full yep. uh the full transit 
Um, and there's only like certain parts of the transit that are most important because it's like when part of the planet, like when the last bits of the planet are exiting, then, then it's more atmosphere per unit planet. Yes. Um, and you can get a better idea of what's in the what's what's getting blocked as that light is passing through the atmosphere. Yeah. And such such a key part of this whole story of exoplanet spectroscopy is the fact that really, really interesting molecules happen to have their spectral signatures in the infrared part of the spectrum. Ah, um, so yeah. things like water vapor we've seen with Hubble, right? That's in the near infrared, and we have near infrared capability mm -hmm. with Hubble. Um, but also things like methane and <coughs> carbon dioxide, like some of those, you know, really mm -hmm. interesting things in planet atmospheres. And um, we now have the capability, so this is the first ever exoplanet spectrum to cover that full wavelength range. Um, mm -hmm. You can't do infrared spectroscopy from the ground, hardly at all, because the atmosphere absorbs infrared light, mostly, thankfully, or we would not be a happy species. Um, so that's why it's so good to have um, an uh, infrared observatory in space, is cause, because now we can access right. that part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Yeah. And those two things are actually the same thing because the reason our atmosphere blocks infrared light is because those molecules like carbon dioxide and oxygen and nitrogen are good at absorbing infrared light, which is why they are the exact same thing where like you can see them in atmospheres, yes. uh, but only if you're detecting infrared exactly. light. So it's being the very thing that's being blocked that we want to detect by an exoplanet is also being blocked by our atmosphere. Yep, for sure. Yeah. Cool. Light bulb uh, <laughs> feeling there. We're definitely going to make an episode on SciShow about whether or not Webb can, will, will sort of be able to tell us if we've found a planet that has, like, a living system of some kind. How would we make that guess? My exoplanet uh, scientists, colleagues, and friends tell me that as, as <laughs> awesome as JBST is, we still aren't quite going to be able to get what we need in order to like point at a planet and say, yep, that one has evolved life. Like we're going to need a mm -hmm. telescope that's even bigger and even more powerful. Um, so, and we're, we're thinking about how to build that telescope now, right? We're working on that next yeah. big telescope. Um, so maybe if we get like really, 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 really lucky um, and find a system that's close enough, you know, with all the caveats, then maybe. Um, but it seems yeah. like we're going to need an even bigger, more powerful telescope to like definitively say, yes, that planet right. is inhabited. Um, yeah, but it's got, it's got plants. Or right, something. right. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> we had, so I was saying, I review all the NASA materials for this telescope. And we had this video come out a few years ago that one of our industrial partners had made. And it had like a little, a little plant springing up, you know, talking about the telescope. We're like, no, 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 no. There is no alien <laughs> lettuce is going to end up in our NASA videos. We can't promise that. Yeah, I know you're not a, an exoplanet researcher, and I, I'm hopefully going to talk to yes. one soon, actually. Uh, but um, I think that the the issue there is is that, you know, with these with like gas giants that are close in, they're blocking a lot of light. Um, with, with planets that might be more sort of habitable zone, rocky planets with water on them. They're further out, and there's a lot of reasons why further out makes it harder. You know, you're less likely to get a transit. You're also less, like, that transit uh, is going to happen less often, so you're going to be able to detect more of them because the further out right. you are, the less frequently you orbit. And then uh, and, and then also, like, it's just you're smaller. Like, a lot of the like, gas giants are big. 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 Yeah. There's a lot of reasons why uh, big and fluffy. Yeah, their atmospheres are big, too. Um, so there's a lot of reasons why this is... Uh, tricky and why th this first planet was like the perfect one to do quick because you it's orbiting really fast so you get the transit and you know when it's going to happen it's a super fluff ball because it's like like half the mass of jupiter but the size yeah. of jupiter so it's super mm -hmm. fluffy so there's lots of reasons why it's a good a good candidate um but the i mean spectrum is beautiful but i'm holding out hope maybe, maybe. maybe. who knows Never and also like you get signs and you're like that looks promising and then the next time you're like we're gonna look yeah, at that for sure gonna look at that yeah, really hard yeah for yeah. sure and i think it's also interesting that like i mean this is the case with all of astrophysics like we don't quite know what we don't know and um That's you know true. it's so easy yeah. to get uh sort of trapped in our own way of thinking you know about life you know we're thinking about carbon-based life and right now that's all we kind of know of yeah um so that's what we're looking yeah. for and um, mm -hmm. even in terms of like our solar system you know our earth is orbiting you know this medium yellow star but we actually 
now know that you know planets can orbit different kinds of stars you know these m dwarfs that can yep. have their rocky mm. planets in much closer so i yes. i just think that yeah yeah i think we're gonna blow who, who knows the doors up. open on exoplanet research and it's gonna be awesome yeah i i assume that uh jwst is looking at the trappist system yes. um quite quite soon which is this very weird system where all the planets are very yeah. close in but it's a small dimmer star um, and so it has, and it has three that are sort of in the area where <clears throat> water could be liquid on the surface and one's like right smack in the yeah. middle. So anyway, I'm excited to see that data, but who knows what's up. Uh, so a lot of people are asking about the diffraction spikes, which I think are the Yeah, are they pretty? Like, I mean, what perfect <laughs> stars yeah. they are, but people are concerned about them as like, will they occlude important targets? Um, why, why not build a telescope that doesn't have them? Uh, and, and how, how do you work around them if you need to work around yeah, them? Yeah, these diffraction spikes are really, it's just physics, right? It is um, a result of the optics and we're stuck with yeah. them and they are yeah. what they are. Um, they're actually really pretty, I think. If you can't be with the one you love, love the one you're with. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and we can actually tell things about the optics. I mean, the, the images are so good. Like if you look at that super bright star that's near the middle of the deep field, like if you look in detail yeah. at the diffraction spikes, you can see structure in them. And, you know, oh, yeah, we can yeah. tell about, you know, details about the optics from looking at the details of the diffraction spikes. So in an image like this, this particular image, the deep field, there are quite a few stars in that field. And yeah, of course, you could have a chance alignment of a diffraction spike over a galaxy I really want to study. But, you know, I mean, there's thousands of galaxies. And we, we there's a pick, lot of galaxies. We can pick another <laughs> one. So it doesn't yeah. worry us that much. Yeah. Yeah. I've also heard that you might just be able to sort of like eat the telescope yep. a little bit and that eats the diffraction yeah, that's, spikes if you really need to that's do for that. sure and we we use that technique um on for for lots of different reasons but um some of the instruments yeah. on jwst that get spectra basically allow you to get spectra of essentially everything in the field at once so this is called grism yeah. spectroscopy i actually did a lot mm. of this for my own dissertation research and it's really cool because you get the dispersed light of every object in the image, which is great until you have two images that line up and the spectra overlap. So, but then same thing when you turn the detectors, then you oh. can you can sort all that out. It's really hard to do, but you can do it. So when you're saying a spectra, you're basically saying like the 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 light that comes off of something, it's going to look maybe white, but it's going to have a bunch of different colors in it at different wavelengths. And you'll be able to d divide all of those wavelengths up. Basically, you've got like a stacked image that's all these different wavelengths. When you stack them all together, it looks white. But when you pull them all apart, one white thing might look different from another white thing. And you can tell things about that thing based on which wavelengths it's yep, radiating. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's really just, like you said, splitting up light into its sort of constituent parts. Right. I mean, it's what a prism does, right? And um, mm. again, spectra are not as pretty. Uh, is the images and there's they are where the they're where the data where is. The That's how you find yes, stuff out. The physics yeah. and astrophysics is in the spectra, and um, you yeah. can of course do astrophysics with imaging. But if you really want to get down to the physics, the physics are in the spectra. Right. I think about seventy percent of the first year of observations are spectroscopy. Right. So that tells you how important it is to astronomers. But also the spectra are in the images, kind of. Like the, the yeah. you know, a lot of the same data you're doing spectroscopy, you, you can turn that into images that we can see as people who just want to see pretty pictures. How worried should I be about micrometeorites? Oh, yeah. So we had predicted, sort of expected to get about one micrometeoroid hit a month. Yeah. on average um, and that's about how many we've gotten so our sort of estimates of how many hits we would get are about right um, one of the micrometeoroids that hit us um, a couple of months ago was larger than we expected and it does when a micrometeoroid hits one of the mirrors it does you know it moves it but of course we detect those movements and we can move it back so that's <laughs> essentially what we do um, so if we get a hit that is big enough to actually cause you know, a, um, an aberration to the mirrors, we adjust for that. Um, so yeah, so we don't have to be worried. Um, but <laughs> we did get you, one. You, we, don't, we don't have to be worried. You're, that's not what your face said. 
<laughs> well, I mean, we, a lot of we us don't were... have to be worried, but we we are. By which I mean, I am a little like <laughs> there's concern. It's a long mission, and we want to be able to take take the quality of image that we're taking now for the whole time. What what we can say definitively is that even with the micrometeoroid hits that we're getting, we are still not only meeting but exceeding the mission requirements. Yeah. Like it's not a big deal. It really yeah. isn't a big deal right now. Okay, that's great. And and like the like these mirrors have I don't know, some ridiculous number of like actual tiny little motors in them that cha can change the shape of the mirror. Not a lot, but a lot. You know, a lot for you know, yeah. like more more than it is needed, but of course, extremely finely. That's Absolutely, cool. and that's one of the the real innovations on the telescope. Is yeah, each eighteen hexag, each of the eighteen segments has this actuator on the back that's able to move it, and I think eight degrees of freedom. So mm -hmm. uh, we're able to really, really sort of tweak up the mirror, and that's planned. It's sort of routine ops. You know, every so often um, we will go in and you know make sure the mirror is you know as perfect as it can be how do you tell how far away a galaxy is from us again back to spectroscopy uh that's where the physics is and so the way we determine galaxy distances is by taking a spectrum so splitting the galaxy's light up um, and we see telltale signatures in the spectrum like emission lines okay mm -hmm. hydrogen is going to be the big one and it has these very distinct um you know emission lines these very distinct little bumps in the spectrum right. and so this is um, like when a hydrogen atom gets hot it radiates uh you know photons and exactly and you're you're seeing those and it radiates those photons at specific wavelengths exactly specific okay. wavelengths and um of course uh when we observe it, um, observe that we're able to tell, you know, which elements are showing up by the fact that they emit, they emit those same wavelengths in space as they do on the ground. And so right. here on the ground, we can set up a hydrogen <clears throat> lamp, take a spectrum yep. of it and say, oh, there's where the bumps are. This is also just proof that physics is consistent across the whole galaxy and across the whole time of the galaxy or exactly. the universe, I mean, um, mm -hmm. which is just, I mean, I don't see why it wouldn't be, but now we have proved that it is. Yep. There it is. Hydrogen is the same, you know, uh, billions of light years away as it is here. The sort of getting from those lines to the distance is we look at where those lines are in the spectrum based uh -huh. on where they quote unquote should be if the galaxy was sitting right next right. door. Yeah. And that's the red shift, right? That's the lines shift to the red the further away they are. Because the universe is expanding. The, the the light from that object has been stretched by that expansion of the universe and we know how fast the universe is expanding and yep. we can tell by how far that has shifted how far away it is because the universe has then been expanding for longer if it's farther away that's right so if the universe wasn't expanding we wouldn't be able to tell how far away a galaxy was well I mean, you'd have some ideas, but you wouldn't be able to use that ideas. technique. Right, right, right. Yeah, you you would have different. Yeah, different ways. It just feels like uh, I, I don't know, like, of of course, we use the way that you use the properties of the universe to understand the universe. Like there isn't another way to do it. But yeah. like, it feels like a good universe. I don't know. I don't know if it could be another way, but it, it feels like it feels there's no particular reason why it is this way. It feels like yeah. a good universe. It's got a lot of, you know, it's got a lot of empty space. Mm -hmm got a lot, a lot of empty, empty space. space but it's and also got a fair amount of stuff that's and true. it's got systems for bringing that stuff together without that what would we have <laughs> well and we're also we're in a like a really good time also in in, in the space. universe's life yep because think you know in the far 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 future oh yeah you know as the universe expands and accelerates at some point we won't even be able to see another galaxy well we, that's yeah. we'll still be around at that point but no. you know <laughs> That's where dark energy is taking us. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think about this sometimes with uh, like rogue stars, so stars that exist between galaxies. Yeah, there's, there's no reason why that star couldn't have a planet and that planet couldn't have people and those people mm -hmm. wouldn't have anything in their sky. Yeah, like, that, they wouldn't. Such a weird they wouldn't. Thing to think about. You know, like yeah. they probably would build telescopes to look at the other planets in their system. You know, yeah. they'd have planets yeah. in their sky. Uh, and then once they did that, they would probably start noticing these smudges. 
And then once they did that, they'd probably build telescopes that could look at this like we did, where it's like, what yeah. is what are those smudges? And yeah. and, and then they'd be like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> wow. yeah. But this was an interesting thing. Do you remember Oumuamua, the uh, yeah. our little inter inter interstellar visitor? Uh -huh. It's very strange to me to have thought for a, quite a while. Well, there's no way we could ever sort of like know the, you know, like actually know the physical properties of like rocks mm -hmm. in other solar systems, and then like. A couple of years later, after having had that thought, it was like, oh, a rock from another solar system came exactly. by. <laughs> Thanks, rock. Good yeah. to see you. So yeah. we assume that that happens uh, since we've seen it happen. Uh, we assume that it, that it happens more than one time and it could, and it could happen again. Um, would the web be able to give us interesting information about that situation? For, yeah, for sure. And um, don't quote me on this, but I'm pretty sure there's another one and i'm pretty sure we're planning to look at it well um, you say don't quote you on that do you mean i need to edit that out of the video no 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 you okay. don't um okay. but i'm trying to to make sure i'm remembering things correctly okay so we think <laughs> um, there's one on its way we've we're getting better at detecting them i think there's one that's been discovered it didn't okay. get as much attention as the muamua sure. in yeah. the popular media um but i think there's another one and i think we're planning to look at it what what can you learn about it by looking at it? The infrared properties of of such an object, I guess, would be interesting. Yeah, you I get this. Know. You look at the spectra and you see yeah, what exactly. you see what's radiating. That's the that's the shift that I I sort of have to make is that what we're looking at is different atoms vibrating, like mm -hmm. like taking in energy and then re-releasing that energy in the infrared, yep. and different atoms and molecules release that that those photons in different wavelengths right and we can use that to know what it's made out of exactly <laughs> so yeah cool. and and we can use just the the sort of basic property of light to see back to these very very distant times and of course yeah. jwst was initially built to find the that very first epoch of galaxies that were born after the big bang mm -hmm. right with hubble we've been able to look back in time see very very distant galaxies but we, we haven't been able to see the first galaxies that were formed after the Big Bang. It's like yeah. a part of this little slice of space that's super important to the overall evolution of the universe. And it's been completely hidden from us. And so this telescope was designed to find those galaxies. And now with this first um, deep field, we see that we're going to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and so and that also has to do, of course, with redshift, because um, those galaxies are so far away and their light's been traveling through space for so long from such a far distance that their light, the ultraviolet light that was emitted mm -hmm. by their stars, <clears throat> has been shifted all the way into the, the infrared part of the spectrum. Yeah. So we have to have a powerful infrared telescope to see them. And now we have one. So that's going to be, I think, incredible. So can you tell me a little bit of why it's so tricky to see infrared light from the ground we've already sort yeah, of talked not, about this not an option Almost from the ground impossible. but we got like spitzers up there but you see pictures from spitzer and you're like that looks like data not like a picture um and that's because spitzer's relatively small yeah um you know it's um i think 85 centimeters so it's a pretty small telescope mm -hmm. and um you know the bigger your you know. telescope the There's sharp. nothing wrong with that. It's cheap. Nothing you get it up there, you get a lot of good data. Yeah. Awesome. yeah and Spitzer has been amazing, you know, yeah. and it has helped us learn how to do infrared optics in space. Yeah. Um, the, the mirrors, you know, we had Spitzer's mirrors also made out of beryllium, same stuff that JWST's mirrors are. So we definitely learned right. a lot from Spitzer to be able to build this telescope. Um, so, yeah, but it, when it comes down to like image quality, it's all about the size of the mirror. And with this humongous mirror looking at infrared light, that's where, why we're able to see so much more. And infrared light in particular, so it's hard to see because first you have to be very cold. So did yes. Spitzer have like liquid cooling or something? Yes. Okay, yep. so it actually yeah. like cooled itself down with like helium or something. Right, right. So yeah, so Spitzer had um, uh, uh, expendable coolants. Yeah. Um, JWST has four instruments one of its four is a mid-infrared instrument mm -hmm. um, and that one has active cooling so it really? has um, a refrigerator sort of cryogenic refrigerator built into it so then it can get even colder um Whoa. so the whole telescope in general sits at colder about than space 
Colder than space, yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. yeah, so the ambient temperature out in that part of space is like 30, 40 Kelvin, something like that. Right, because um, so, it's still in the solar system and then the... It's yep. there's the sun is around. It gets, it's around. Yeah, yeah, it's far away. But but around. it's like sitting so that it's blocking all of the sun from heating it up. Exactly. So that's what the big heat shields are for to keep it cool. Right. Right. Okay. Right. For near infrared light, that temperature is fine. No big mm -hmm. deal. Um, but for mid infrared, um, in these longer wavelengths, our instrument has to be even colder. And so it's and the reason is that like down. literally like th that heat, even though it's very cold, that's still heat is actually like the instrument itself would be radiating exactly infrared in those yeah. wavelengths and thus muddying the image exactly right wow, mm -hmm. that's wild yeah um, and then the other thing that's hard about it you need extra big mirrors because infrared light is <laughs> in a sense bigger um, exactly. though maybe I'm, maybe, maybe there's a better way to say that yeah so yeah the sharpness of an image depends um, directly on the wavelength of light, the length of the waves of the light, and uh -huh. the size of the mirror, inverse, yeah. inversely. And so um, when you're looking at longer wavelengths, you need a bigger mirror in order to get that same resolution. That's cool. And so that's, my, that's why the, uh, the mid-infrared images are a little less crisp, because there's right. bigger waves. Mm -hmm. That's so cool! Oh, yeah. physics! Yeah. I feel like I know so much more now than I did an hour ago. <laughs> awesome! <laughs> So uh, last thing I want to ask you is, do you have any proposals and uh, and and are they are you going to get data to crunch yourself? Yes. Um, wow. So I'm on a couple of different I guess I'm on three proposals that are getting science in this first year. Uh, and one of them is one of these early release science programs, one of the ones that are going to be taken soon. And in fact, a lot of that data has already been taken. Nice. Um, so we have data in hand from that. That's called the Sears Project, C-E-E-R-S. Um, Steve Finkelstein down at uh, UT Austin's the PI for that. He and I were grad students together. Cool. Um, and so that's one team I'm on. I'm also on a team that's getting early data um, from my uh, dissertation advisor. Um, and then another team I'm on, it's sort of all three different types of data that's being taken this year, was from a, a proposal that we wrote um, to start to learn about sort of galaxy kinematics, like how things are moving inside galaxies. So lots of fun data coming up. So what was the, what's the first thing that you're getting? What, what are you trying to find out with that one? I'm interested in how um, stars form in galaxies and how that process changes over time. Mm -hmm. um, in particular, how a lot of the galaxies that we see in the distant universe have these gigantic clumps of star formation, which is weird. It's different than galaxies like, you know, in the, the present day universe. Mm -hmm. And I'm interested in how like the details of how that star formation happens in clumps and how it's so, sort of related to um, to other types of galaxies that are themselves just like these chunks of forming stars. That sort of process of how stars form in galaxies over time is is what I'm interested to dig into soon. That's awesome. Get, getting more granular into our history. Yeah. I love that thought that we live at a good time in the universe. Yep. Like there's so much interesting stuff going on. We can see enough of our past to predict what the future is like. Um, and uh, we're not so far in the future that we can't see our past anymore. What a time to be alive. I agree. Thank you so much for spending some time with me, but also for all of the uh, work that you've done communicating about this. And, um, you know, I'm, I, I'm, I'm sure that there has been a lot of, uh, there's been a lot of work that you've had to do. Uh, and in addition to that, you've been doing the work, helping people understand it and being uh, a voice for it and um, just capturing that excitement so effectively. So I'm, I'm so pleased that we have gotten to know each other uh, and that I get that, that you listen, that you respond to my direct messages. <laughs> of course, it's been it's been fun. And I appreciate the work that you do to get all this cool stuff out to yeah. out to the world, too. It's really important. That's why I spend time doing it. You know, this is this is a telescope funded by you and by yeah. your viewers. It's a, you know, it is. Yep. It's, a tax it's our payment. telescope. Yes, it's, it is in a very literal sense. We all pay yeah. for it collectively. And yes. I think that's a good thing. You know, I think oh, yeah. um, the fact that it is not only that it is, you know, funded by people, regular people, but the data, everything's available to everybody too. You know, these mm -hmm. are images for the world. Yeah. And I think, you know, we've seen with this first week of the worldwide excitement over it, 
you know, it's it's a good thing. It's a good oh, investment. It's a very good thing. Yeah, people have been asking me all week, like, how do you feel? <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, I feel like relieved that it all yeah. worked because it was so hard. I feel like uh -huh. joyful, like to see mm -hmm. these images. I just feel so much joy and also like hope, you know, yeah. that we can we can do good things when we come together to tackle big, big challenges. And this yeah. was one of those. Oh, yeah. And it gives me hope. It's yeah. this little like spark of light and spark of goodness and beauty. Mm -hmm. Um, in, in the world, and I'm happy to be a part of it. <laughs> Thanks uh, so much for spending some time, and um, if you want to follow Amber on Twitter, what is it? Astronomer. But spelled like Strawn. Strawn, like my name. last name, yeah. It's very good. <laughs> you have to do that if that's the situation. Like, when did people first point out to you that your last name was Strawn and you were becoming well, an astronomer? <laughs> Um, I joked that I married my husband to get that oh. last name. Uh, okay. So, yeah. <laughs> it just, it was a happy accident. <laughs> yeah, nice, nice. Uh, well, thank you so much. Uh, and I'll, I will, I'm sure I'll be asking you more questions soon. Awesome. Looking forward to it.